I'm glad you all were here today. I want you to open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. It's on page 1742 of the Yellow Bible. And children can go downstairs if you'd like. Chapter 11, page 1742. And I want you to hold on to this. We're going to read this a minute. But there's a remnant here that we're talking about. And I'm wondering if some churches within the churches or churches as a whole are the leftovers, those that are still holding on to the blood of Jesus, holding on to the true gospel, which is what? The kingdom of God. The Bible is very clear. For Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And we're therefore looking forward to the day that we enter into this kingdom. Spiritually, we're already there. Because if you have the Holy Spirit living in you, the Holy Spirit is living, therefore the kingdom of God is in you. But there's going to be a time when the King of kings and the Lord of lords is going to come down from heaven and sit on this planet and rule for a thousand years. Those of us that are alive will meet him in the sky when he shows up. What's interesting, though, is those that died in Christ will rise first. You know, so I'm thinking about this with my dad. My dad died in 1989. You know, 89, I think it was, yeah. And so one day, if I'm alive... Who's going to meet me in the sky? My dad. If he, if he, and I believe he was a, a Christian. I believe he was saved. You know, he might get up there and says, look at me. What took you so long, boy? <laughs> but you see, it's going to be a great day. It's not a day of sadness. It is going to be for those that don't believe. It is going to be for those that play church or pretend to be Christians. Do you know there's many of those, right? We call them false prophets. It's a whole other story. So let's look at what the Bible tells us. Romans 11, chapter, verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he forsook. Right here. Who is Paul's people? The Israelites, the Jews. Many people today are preaching that God has abandoned the Jews and now the church is the new Jews. If that is true, then the Bible's wrong. I don't think so either. I agree. So, or do you not know that the scripture says that Elijah... How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have received for myself 7,000 men whom have not bowed the knee to bow. Even so then, at the present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. What's the sermon? There's a remnant, but here's the thing we've got to pay attention to. How did that remnant come in? Through grace. Not through our power and not through our thinking that we got it figured out. Through grace. And if by grace then it is no longer works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But it is of works, it is no longer grace, either wise Work is no longer work. What then? Israel has obtained that it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. The rest were blinded, just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, to this very day. I feel that today. I have talked to people. I'm going to pick on Ralph a little bit. Ralph, don't get mad at me. Before we went to Africa, I said, Ralph, when we go, you got to have 
$100 crisp bills because they will not exchange anything else, and the $100 bills got to be crisp. I, it, it, is that hard to understand? <laughs> Somebody didn't get the message. Now, he wasn't alone because the other guy that went with us did the exact same thing. Actually, he did it worse because we even told him how to do the WhatsApp. Don't need that. I've got a phone that can do international calls. Okay. Now he says, oh, man, the WhatsApp's so cool. I'm like, okay. Blinded and deaf. Okay. But God did that to Israel. It's bad enough we do it to ourselves. Can you imagine God blinding you? I, God, I want the light, not the blindness. Does that make sense? Let their tables become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. That's a serious thing. You know? We want our eyes open. But God blinded the Israelites because of, their, because of their disbelief or their rebellion. And I believe God is blinding churches today because of their rebellion. They are doing things that's directly against the word of God. And they think it's okay. And they think it's all right. Let me tell you something. When you do that, you are stepping into this where God now is going to blind you, where you're not going to be able to see. I mean, you, mean you, you come to church today. Many people, did they notice you coming to church? You know, a lot of people are still in bed. Or sometimes driving in, you see them driving in the opposite direction. I told you before how us, us our church, our, our neighbor, was wondering about us because we we're Christians, and he asked me, he was a Muslim, he asked me, he says, what's the difference between you and your other neighbors? And I go, what are you talking about? He says, I know, you know we're Muslims. I said, yeah. Well, I know they're Christians, but you're the only family we see getting up in the morning going to church. You see, just your action has a demonstration you all right? Now, how did they, um, I'm, I'm, I got to throw my Tina, my Tina thing in there. How did they know that we were going to church on Sunday morning? They were watching, but how did they know? How did they know I wasn't just going to the grocery store? Okay. We didn't dress like the heathens. You know, my wife always tells people, yeah, God says come as you are, but if you were invited, and now I'm not talking politics, okay? For, take the guy that's in office out of, the, out of your mind, okay? It's a gutter mind. If you were invited to the White House for dinner, okay, and you're going to have all these dignitaries there, and if you're honest with yourself, what clothes would you wear? Huh? What clothes would you wear, honestly? You're coming here, and we just sat at the table with God. So is God less than the President of the United States? Think about it. See, I don't care. Only thing I asked was one thing, that you do wear clothes, okay? I really would appreciate it. I think other people in the congregation would appreciate it, all right? But sometimes we've got to be careful because we're not judging by the way people dress because that may be the best they got. And if that's the best they got and you, don't, and you think they should wear a suit and tie... 
then I suggest you take them downtown, down to Kokomo, and buy them a suit. Or buy them a dress. A suit would be cheaper because you start putting dresses on women, it's shoes, it's studs, it's earrings, it's purse. Oh, the purse. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the, the purse and hair bands. And just, it just, just keeps. But you see, when you came to church, you were making a statement. And that statement is a statement of faith. And I can joke around to how you dress and stuff, but you know what? All I care is that you did get up and come to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last week, a lady was, lamp uh, she was complaining, crying. She's saying that Christianity is no longer taught in our schools. And she even said, we don't even have Sunday school in our churches anymore. We don't have Sunday nights or Wednesday nights. And she was really complaining. But see, I pointed out something to her. Why don't we have Sunday night service? Because nobody came, comes. Why don't we have Wednesday night service? Nobody comes. Okay. It's not that the church is not willing, but here's the key. In the 1900s, 96% of our children went to Sunday school. By the year 2000, 96% of our children don't go to Sunday school. And we wonder why we don't have God in our schools. When our parents aren't even bringing them to Sunday school, and churches now, because people don't even care, don't even put up Sunday school any longer. You know, we have Sunday school. We actually, we had teachers waiting for people to show up. But parents and grandparents need to bring their children. And that is a task that is given unto you. That is not my job to make you bring your child. That is a responsibility that God has put on you because God gave you that child and God is giving you that opportunity to raise that child in the best Christian home possible. Don't mean you do it perfect, okay? You know? I know you guys can't be like me, a perfect dad, when I brought my kids up. Never made a mistake. You believe that? I got a C-130 airplane out there in the parking lot for sale. But if you continued, here's, a, here's the thing for you. If you continued in your faith since you were a child and you, you kept going to Sunday school, you grew up, you got married... And you, and you continued your walk in faith. You know, you're a very minority today. You are a remnant. That's a remnant of a time past. That's a time that we're losing. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. The old model of how to, how to grow a church was what? Generational, Right. You have children, the children grow up, they have children, they all come to the church and they have children and they sit there with their grandparents, great-grandparents, the mom and my dads, and then they have kids and then there's nieces and nephews and cousins and all that multiplies. We've lost that multiplication system. We need to get back to a different system. And that is to what? Invite people. Get relationships. Bring people in. You know... What's another word for remnant? Leftovers. You know, when I was growing up, we used to always have to eat leftovers. There was things that I grew up with that I hated, and I said I would never do this with my children. I'll never do this. One was I didn't like leftovers, and I didn't like hand-me-downs. You know, your brother wore it, he outgrew it, now it's on you, you know. He, they did that with bicycles, they did that with everything. And I grew up, and I got married, I says, when we have children, I am not going to do hand-me-downs. So God fixed that, put the two children eight, nine, two, uh, 11 months apart, so there was no hand-me-downs. Once they grew up, it's like having twins. But I didn't like leftovers. I wouldn't eat leftovers. We'd go out and eat, 
And Tina says, hey, do we take this home? I said, you can throw it away here, throw it away at the house. I'm not going to eat it. Then I started realizing that's a lot of good stuff thrown away. But you see, a lot of churches, those that are sticking to the word of God, they're doing just that. They're pushing them out. If a pastor preaches the word of God and steps on your toes, you see, we, 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 don't, we don't kill them like we did the old prophets. What do we do? We fire them. We get rid of them. And we go find somebody that's going to give us what we want to hear. But there are a remnant of churches, and I tell you, this is one. People listen to our sermons online. Pastors call me and says, if I preach that sermon, I'd have the elders of the board have me fired the next week. And he asked me, what do I do? I said, preach the sermon. And let that condemnation fall on who it needs to be. Now, you, by not preaching what God is telling you to preach, now you are the one that's in the wrong. If you're worried about a job, you're in the wrong. We need the remnant of pastors that have the courage to stand up against the boards, stand up against the government, stand up against all of these things that are attacking our belief and our system. I tell you right now, and I'll probably get kicked off Facebook, okay? Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, okay, Muhammad, they have different ways to get to heaven. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ alone. He is not the gateway for me to go. I have to accept Jesus. Then I got to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. All you got to do is accept Jesus Christ into your heart, receive the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says you will be saved. But what do we do? The Bible calls us the leftovers or the remnant. And if you're one of those that grew up in church and stayed in church, I mean stayed in church. I grew up in church, but I kind of left the church for a few years. I went through my little wild street. I wanted to see what it was like to do things. All right? I came back. I came back because of church, because I went to church. But you see, I'm not, I'm not included in what I'm talking about right now. Those of you that stayed in church, never fell off, stayed true until you're sitting here today, you are a rarity. You are a rare diamond that is still holding on to that faith. And see, here's the good thing. All of us that went to church and kind of fell back. See, this is the God that we have. What did Jesus do? He says, don't worry about it, Jim. Just, just wait a little bit. I'm going to send my son to die on that cross for you. To get you back. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying... The remnant. How many in this congregation, you don't need to raise your hands, but you know how many you were. I doubt if there's one or two people in this congregation that didn't fall off and then come back. See, that's the pure remnant. But you see, there's going to be a remnant that's going to come. And it's going to be a remnant that God is going to do, and he's going to bring his people back. He's going to bring them back so that they can receive Jesus Christ as the Messiah and they will believe in his name. And that day will come when the Israelites will bend the knee when they will accept Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And I believe many churches today 
will bend the knee one day and come back and throw away all their secular garbage, all their secular traditions, and come back to the Word of God and truly surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. I believe that remnant is today. I believe, like Paul, he included himself. I include myself. I was one of those that went to church, grew up in church, and then decided to go my little wild spirit. Thank goodness it was only a couple of years before I woke up and realized I need to get back in church. But Paul included himself in this. Paul was a man that knew scriptures but didn't believe in the Messiah. Paul was a man that went out persecuting the church. Paul was a man that says, he was one of those. But through the grace of Jesus Christ, he was brought back. Paul, in fact, believes that God had promised that they will be saved from all apostasy, Romans eleven twenty six. 26. He touched the importance of the relationship of the church with Israel today. That the church is supposed to make Israel jealous. But the church has been terrible against the Jews. The church has been terrible against the, those that are supposed to be called by God. I heard a story the other day. A woman, Jewish, she is a survivor of the Holocaust. And they were ministering to her. And she says, wait a minute. You want me to join the church that helped persecute me when I was in Germany? You know the church did that, right? You know the Roman Catholic Church actually backed Hitler. And many Protestant churches did. There's a few that didn't. Bohemer didn't. But he was executed. You know, we talk about this morning... We complain about how long the sermons are. We complain about how hard the seats are or if the weather or the temperature is not right in the building. Saturday morning, I got a message. You remember I told you I was invited to go speak at Myanmar? You guys remember that? The pastor that invited me to go speak was executed by the Muslims Saturday morning. When they surrounded his church... They told him he needs to denounce Christ or die. Did not, did not give in. But you know, I wonder if my situation, I wonder if I had that faith. I wonder if I would be able to stand up to that. I ask God all the time, I say, Lord, I mean, here's a guy invited me to come and speak at his church and teach at his church saying that I could help him, but yet I know he had more faith than I would probably ever have. I mean, I'm just like, it's amazing. And then Americans think they can go overseas and be better Christians than they are. We were in Korea, preaching in Korea, and I remember the church we're preaching at, and he says, hey, man, I'm sorry you had to go speak at this little church like your other friends had to speak at big churches. And I go, I went, uh, how big's your church? He says, well, we're about 12,000 to 15,000. And I looked at him and says, I'm coming from a church of 60. You know? And they said, well, we want to hear from the man of God. I'm looking at him like, I need to sit down. And I told the church, I said, you guys need to start coming to America and bring that kind of faith and that kind of dedication to America. You know, people, churches, unbelieving communities, they need to see a positive force in our churches, not a judgmental church, not a church that's going to judge people because they don't like the way they dress or look. 
you know, I think we should have a fine for every man that comes to church that don't have a beard. You know, you know, Jesus had a beard. And you want to be like Jesus, you better grow your beard. Does that make sense? You see, that's what works does. That's what religion do. What I would like you to do is when you come to church, come with an expectation, not to hear from Jim, an expectation to hear from the Holy Spirit, an expectation to have an encounter with God. You know, God had his church because of what he, he actually said in 2 Peter 3, 9. This is because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It says not all come to first Christian church. It says all come to repentance. And we are doing that around the world. Matter of fact, Ghana right now is listening to our services. There's Kenya listening to our services. There's Uganda. There's South America. There's Mexico. There's a whole list of countries that are listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ that this church is doing. That's why we need to do it in the excellence you know what? If Peru don't want to listen to it, God said, fine. I'll have somebody in Ghana listen to the message then. You know, we sometimes think that we're the most important people in the world. I'm going to tell you who the most important people in the world is. That person that is on drugs, that is sitting on the streets, that's living down there on the river, that is so gone, gone that can't take a shower, hasn't taken a bath in three weeks. That's the most important person in the world. You know why? Because God sent his son to die for that person. Not for the nicely dressed and nicely cut and perfectly mannered people. Well, he died for them too, didn't he? Actually, he did. In Romans 11, in chapters 12 through 15, Paul shows more details about the practice, and about the understanding of what it means about the remnant. The idea of the remnant of God's people is nothing new. In one sense, the Bible story is called by many remnants, by many people throughout history, throughout many times. How many of you read about Noah? How many, how many was on that remnant? Eight. Eight. Noah's family. God called family of Abraham out of decaying Babel empire. God was, look at Gideons. God put 300 Gideons to go and face 135,000 Midianites. You know who the Midianites are? You guys really want to know who the Midianites are? The Philistines. Who are the Philistines? Who's fighting Israel right now? The Palestinians. Just let you know. But God used 300. There's a remnant. Was there more? Did you guys ever read the story about Gideon? Yeah, he said, I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. Because you see, God wanted to show his power through a remnant of Israel. And we talked about Saturday morning about Donald Trump. I'm going to tell you something. Everybody's talking about Donald Trump being saved by God. I'm going to tell you, be careful. If, if Donald Trump was saved by God because God ordained him, according to some people, with his blood on his ears, that means he will be the president of the United States and he's going to do good. What if he doesn't? And you just said that God ordained him. What if you just became a false prophet. I would rather let God take control and let God put the person that he wants into the office because he's going to put the person that I deserve. We got what we deserve right now. Be careful saying what God, you know, it really bothers me. Because now, if it doesn't happen according to what you're saying, every one of those pastors that have said that it should be called out and declared a false prophet, a false teacher. 
I would rather be like the Gideons where there's no way this person is going to win. And then God put them in power. And you know what? It may not be the people that you think. It may not even be Kamara Harris. It may not even be Trump. It may be somebody else that we never heard of. Maybe a Daniel that's being at 16 was called by God to bring this nation back. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. And I don't claim to be a prophet. But you've got to be careful saying a circumstance and declaring it being an ordination by God. If it is, good. If it's not, then I want you to stand up and say, stone me. That's what the Bible says that prophets are supposed to. You see, God called a remnant of his people. And he called them in Jeremiah 24. The, when he, these were the good figs that were called in. But here's the thing, the remnant with the Babylonians... Daniel, can you imagine 16 years old, roughly, being, being a godly man, doing all the right things, but because of his nation doing wrong, because you had a bad king or bad president, bad congress, modernize it. He went into captivity, and to me it's a personal problem, they made him a eunuch. Hello? You guys don't have issues with that? Okay? But yeah, he still held on. See, that's the remnant. Even when bad things happen, you hold on. Paul 11, he talks about Elijah. What did Elijah do? You know, I'm always amazed by Elijah. Here's a man that does all these miracles. He just beat all of these priests at Mount Carmel. He just called fire from heaven just consumed all that water. Thousands of these prophets were killed. He just did all this great miracle. And then a little woman stands up and goes, boo, and he goes running. Jezebel. And I tell you, there's many Jezebels in our churches across America today. Do you know when, you, when I was told when I started coming to churches... And my wife can testify to this. I was told, find the true leaders of that church. Find the woman that's leading that church. And don't cross her. What have I just been told to do? Okay. Elijah ran out and then he cried. God, 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 I'm the only one left, Lord. How can this happen to me? Let's look at Elijah, man. You just called, I mean, you stood in this altar. You just called fire from heaven. And you're acting like a little wimp. I mean, it looked like you joined the Navy or something. <laughs> he ran and cried. But what did he do? What did God say? He says, I have reserved myself 7,000 who have not bowed a knee. So think about what, you, what we're reading. We're reading about Elijah, a prophet. He's thinking he's, as lo he's alone. God has told him, says, no, there's 7,000 more. You know what? I would love to read their works. Wouldn't that be cool to find out what those 7,000 were doing? One day when we get to heaven, you can ask that question. Hey, you, 
You're one of the 7,000. What were you doing back then, dude? But here's what the lesson here for us. We're not alone, guys. We're not alone as the remnant of teaching the full gospel, the full counsel of God. We're not alone. We may not know who other churches are, but there's thousands of them out there doing it. There's thousands of them out there that are preaching the truth and not trying to make you feel good and not trying to put rose-colored glasses on the gospel of Jesus Christ, but teaching the truth and telling people, you must repent for that action is a sin. And there is a heaven, and there is a hell. You decide where your destination is. You can either fly first class, or you can be left behind. Elijah was not alone. God had a remnant. The remnant is a matter of God's sovereign grace. Elijah wasn't even aware of the remnant. So it wasn't about how good Elijah was. It wasn't how good he preached. It wasn't how, how he, what do you call it today? Marketing, how his, good his marketing process was. He didn't even know. God, through his grace, I will tell you, how many times have I told you? When we go on mission trips, it is an opportunity to get a blessing. If we do not go, somebody else's blessing will be but you don't need to be foolish about it. I'm going to tell you something. If you think you're smarter than the people that you're going to minister to, you have failed your ministry already. You know, I had a captain, Keespe, on the team. The man grew up in, in Peru, South America, in the mountains. Came out of the mountains, went to Lima. From Lima, got on a boat. On the boat, he jumped ship, got to America. Ronald Reagan gave all of the passes. He got his citizenship, got his green card. Went to school, graduated number two out of Texas A&M. And when he became a captain on my team, I'm sitting there going, I said, you're Peruvian. I says, here, write this lesson up, translate this. I'm going to translate this other one. He looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I says, Kispe, you're from Peru, man. I need these documents translated into Spanish. I'm doing these. I need some help. He says, Jim, I can't read and write Spanish. And I looked at him. I said, wait a minute. You graduated number two out of Texas A&M. You were an adult when you got out of Peru. You learned English. You learned how to read and write it good enough to be number two. You know, Texas A&M is not a flop school. I mean, it's a tough school. And, and you can't read and write Spanish? What I'm trying to get at, you see, just because he hadn't learned doesn't make him dumber. He's smarter than I was. I could never do what he did in Texas A&M. But I kind of gloated a little bit. and said, ha, ha, a gringo is going to teach you Spanish, boy. <laughs> and he looked at me and he says, I am a captain. But what I'm telling you is, if when we go into mission fields, if we think you're the smartest, the devil has already gotten into your pride. Go and learn. Go and bring what God has to bring you, but learn from them. Man, they've got experiences. I've learned so much from these trips I go on. They've got experiences that we would never have. And we learn. In Elijah's day, there was people that God had already set aside. And my question is, would be, is, wait a minute, God. If I was Elijah, I said, well, then, do you think I'm going to die? I mean, if you've got 7,000 reserved over here, I mean, don't you kind of know what's going to happen to me? What, what, what would just happen right then? Then doubt would have come in, or I'd get the eye disease. Anybody know what the eye disease is? I, it's all about I, 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 I did this, I do that, I did this, I accomplished, I did this, I, 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 I. You get the eye disease or the me disease or I'm better than you disease. If you ever get there, 
We need to come to the cross and get repentance. See, the elect was chosen by grace. It was chosen by God. So, here's the answer. Who were these remnants? They were elect and chosen by grace. They were elect and chosen by grace. They were elect and chosen by grace. That's it. See, it's not about who we are and what we think we are. It's about how God has called us, and are you stepping up to do the call that God has given you? Jesus said, I know whom I have chosen in John 13, 18. And you did not choose me, but I chose you, John 15, 16. Well, you ever understand what those two verses mean? It was God's grace. You see, we don't decide to come to God. God calls us. We decide to listen to the call. Mission trips the same way. Listen to the call. Let God handle it. We are called to be God's remnant in a time of apostasy. I think terrible things are going to come to America. And I think it's because America has turned its back on God. But I believe America still has a chance if only she would bend a knee and come back to her. Bring God back into our schools, into our government. Bring God back into the places that need to be. You see, the church, is we're not called because we're clever or we're wise or we have influence or we're just good people or we're just holy, godly people. You know, you know people that come to First Christian, they are the true Christians. Those that go to other churches, they are trying to be like us. You know, we got all the answers. And if you don't listen to us, then... Maybe you need to repent. Say, sorry. God chooses. And he's called us. Are we listening? Look at 1 Corinthians 1. It's on page 1752. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. Page 1752. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many nobles are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put a shame to the wise. That God has chosen the weak things of the world to put the shame the things which are mighty. And the base... Things of the world and the things which are despised by God has chosen and the things which are not to be to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Anybody understand what that just said? Guys, it's not us. It's God. How many times have we talked about missions? I've talked about if we do something and God is in it, it's going to be successful. If we do something and it's not successful, God's not in it. So what do we do? Walk away from what's not successful. Because, see, sometimes out of our own imagination, we think it's God telling us. And it's only our imagination. I mean, how many times people ask me, are you going on this mission trip? People that know me, what do I always tell them? I have to have a confirmation. I have to know and feel in my spirit that this is God and not me. So I look for a confirmation. And God is saying, and he'll, he'll bring up the weakness. You see, you don't have to be qualified to work with God. God qualifies those that he calls. Very important for us to understand. You can get all the theological training in the world, but if you think it's from you, you're a fool. Trust in the Lord. And God, the remnant, is called 
to God's plan, not our plan. How many times have we figured, tried to figure it out? You know, with Elijah, why 7,000? You know, maybe it was 6,999. God just rounded it up. Or maybe it was 7,001. I think there was 7,001. I count in Elijah, exactly. He got 7,000 over here, but hey, don't forget me. But 7,000 is important because seven in the Bible is a, is a number of perfection. And I believe he had exactly how many people he needed to save that would take and compare in the size of the nation that he needed to continue the work that he had called them to do. Living in apostasy, living in a time of destruction is not easy. I can imagine those in Miramar right now, those members of that church. Maybe they're asking, where's God? Where's God? But you see, that pastor left an impression 4,000 miles away with me saying, I wish and I hope I have that strength. And I don't know if I do. And I think somebody that's arrogant to say, I'm ready, bring it on. Okay? I had many of these, I mean, in fact, Saturday I had, I had a whole list of books with these prophets. We're ready to die for God when the tribulation comes. We're going to stand up and we will be the remnant. And I looked at them, and I, I followed them. I studied them. I said, man, I wish I had that. COVID comes, they go hide behind it underneath the table. I look at them and says, are you serious? Let me tell you what that taught me. Don't put your faith in men. Put your faith in the word of God and not in men. But you see... Elijah had a bigger problem than Jezebel. See, the tyrannical rule of Jezebel, she was an evil woman, wanted her way, and wanted to do it her way. Now, here's the problem we have with Jezebel's spirit. We always think it's a woman. Men can have the Jezebel spirit. Okay? But let me tell you what's worse than the Jezebel spirit is the Ahab spirit. Let me tell you, who was the king? Ahab. Who was the queen? The Ahab could have stopped her. But he allowed her. And I do believe this on the December 17 people that left here. I believe that we broke the Ahab spirit with the elders and the Jezebel spirit ran from the church. I believe that with all my heart. But we had to break the Ahab spirit first. The Ahab spirit allows the Jezebel spirit to take control of the church. It can't, I'm telling you though, be careful. Just because it's Jezebel doesn't mean it's always a woman. It can be a man. Trust me. The way things are going now, Maybe, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a woman identifying as a man that's identifying as a woman or something. I don't know. No telling nowadays. But the remnant was there. And Elijah, even though he ran from the Jezebel, God said, I still got this. I still got this. Yet God was able to protect and preserve the remnant to keep his message going forward. Paul uses a little phrase and a very powerful one in Romans. Abraham was strong in faith because he was fully convinced that God was able, God was strong enough to do what he has promised. Do you believe that God can do what he has promised in your life? 
although the demise of the church in the United States is very sad, we can also see that God is pruning and we can recognize God's plan in preserving the strength and the final remnant of his people in order to use them to do the restoration that we see in John, John chapter 15, verse 16. It's on page 1658. And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be able with you forever, abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it be. It be neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, he who dwells with you and will be in you. The remnant will have the power of the Holy Spirit in them. And I'm telling you, if you cannot recognize a false prophet, you got a problem. Okay? How do I know a false prophet? One thing is always about himself. He's got the eye disease. The second thing is, he's about his finances. It's about him. He manipulates so that he can get the financing. You know, I went to Africa in Uganda. God, I believe, did a real great calling. But do you know how I got there? Because somebody in this church, I'm going to say his name, Ralph, gave the money okay, to pay for that. I didn't go over there free. It cost somebody something. It cost from their treasury. I tell people all the time that go on mission trips, well, this is free. It's not free. Somebody paid for it. This America needs to learn that every time the government gives a free check, that means he's taking it out of your bank account. There's nothing free. People say, well, gospel's free. Jesus, it's not free. Jesus paid for it on the cross. The remnant is a sign of hope. As long as there's a remnant still preaching the truth, there's hope in America. The remnant brings out a time. It tells us that we need to step up and we need to go out and not be afraid. If you are doing things, like I stood up against BLM, Black Lives Matter. A tr- family left the church over it. I'm telling you, Black Lives Matter is demonic. KKK is demonic. Okay? The Aryan Nation is demonic. Any group that lifts up one race above another is demonic. We are all created equal in the eyes of God. You know, I'm sorry, guys. Not all of you can be as good looking as me. It just, you know, God ran out of that stuff when he started passing out looks. We can joke about it, but, you know, it's serious, though. We're all equal in the eyes of God, man. No matter what the color of our skin, no matter what where we are in this ladder of social social standings, okay, or education. You know, when you get to heaven, you know, oh, I know, I I know what's I know what happened here. See, Dave's getting ready to start college, going back to school to get his 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 degrees, and so when he gets to heaven, God's going to say, "I need to see the degrees first, man." Okay, well, you're going to be ninth in, in line because you were ninth in, the, in, in your graduating class. You think God's going to do that? No. He's going to say, good and faithful servant, enter into the presence of your Lord. That's what I want to hear. How many of us are ready? How many of us sense a call and a purpose to do new things? to reach out and trust in God. Are you remnant? Are you future orientated? Are you always looking back? Are you always looking at your pack in your history? 
You're always looking at what you did wrong. Cut that anchor. Look forward. God's got better and greater things for you in the front. What that happened in the past, don't let the devil put an anchor and drag you down again. You've been set free. That chain has been cut. The blood of Jesus has said, you are my son, you are my daughter. Don't live in the past. Learn from it, but don't live there. Just like at the cross. Too many Christians are living at the cross. We have to go to the cross. We have to nail our sins to the cross. But we got to leave our sins at the cross. And we need to go to the resurrection and see, become alive with Christ. Too many of us are living at the cross. We're living and holding on to that sin, saying, well, as long as I'm here, i got to hold on to this sin. i got to hold on to these things that I did wrong. And Jesus is there on that cross, maybe a tear coming down his face saying, Son, daughter, I paid for it. Get up and walk. You're alive. You are a new creature now. The old has passed away. And don't let people bring your past back to you. When the devil starts doing that, tell the devil, go to hell. Don't let people drag you down. You're precious in the eyes of God. God has such love for you and I. How can we explain this? We can't. Because in Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We can't do this on our own. And we can't do it by listening to people. We got to listen to the word of God, trust the Holy Spirit that's living in us, that we can have that hope, that we can move forward, that our restoration is complete. We're not working on restoration. We've been restored. We're clean. We're a new people. I tell you, the worst people that bring you down are false prophets because they out for themselves. They'll do anything to bring guilt. How many times have I said in this church, if you give money because of guilt, keep the money in your wallet. Give because you feel like the Holy Spirit is leading you to give. We don't want to pass out the offering plate. If you want to give, get up, go to the back of the room and put some money in there. If you don't want to give, stand up, praise God and say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't care. Because if our intent is to bring guilt and make you give, we're no better than the devil. You are equal. We are all equal in the kingdom of God. We had a conversation this morning. You have as much power, probably more than I do. Your faith might be even better than mine. Your faith may even be stronger than mine. I don't go through half the stuff that you probably went through. Elderly people are having a hard time coming in the church. If I'm, if I'm in that situation, will I have enough faith to, to, to hurt and come? And I mean, to me, that's, you know what? That's impressive to me because they're not using the excuse, well, I'm too old. I don't know how many times I heard that. And I think I used it the other week. <laughs> Man, I'm getting old. But you see, sometimes the church can be like the seven churches and lose our faith, lose our way. But my question to you is, you know, this church is reaching a unit in Iraq. They're reaching it with our services, Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, Myanmar, Mexico, Peru, and I don't know how many other places. Can I ask you guys a question? Do you even care? 
that we're reaching all these people around the world? You see what I'm talking about? That's part of our congregation. And you know what? They may not be able to read English. Or like in Kenya and, and Uganda, they speak the weird English, the British English, you know, the corrupted English. Because I know I got the pastor in Uganda upset with me because he was talking about it. And I said, man, you're very British. It was the wrong thing to say. He goes, you know, we kicked the British out of this country. I said, oh, okay. Break. But, you know, we are still reaching. We're the remnant, guys. And I am proud to be part of a church that does care, that does care about what's going on around the world and does give their treasure, their time. This church, how many people here do things that people don't even know? You know? Dave, Dave is learning what it is to be a member of this church. Hey, man, you still got time for practice? Go fix the toilet. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, ladies. <laughs> Saturday, I know people are going to come and help fix the lights. See, that's all part of the remnant. That's all part of serving God. So, what do we do from now? Continue studying the word. Continue in the word. And you know what? Continue in doing what we have done that has worked. And quit doing the things that ain't working. Because if it ain't working, it means God's not in it. Anything that God is in works. See, that's why I drive a Ford. Because God's in it and it works. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. Lord, open up our eyes that we are the remnant, Lord, that we will not cave in to false teachers and false prophets and, and, and the world, Lord, that we will stay true to you and that if anybody complains, you could say, we have a remnant. I've held a remnant in Peru, Indiana. And Lord, let many churches in Peru, Indiana become that remnant. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.